So yeah. thank you again. Um, thank you all for tuning in as I present my project entitled Civilian Nuclear Power in Negotiating the Convention on Nuclear Safety that I conducted under the supervision of my faculty advisor, Professor Sarkar. I spent the um, last two summers as a co-op at the Donald C. Cook nuclear plant out in Michigan, and that's when my interest in nuclear safety really began. There, I learned that nuclear safety must be the overriding priority of all plant personnel in order for them to fulfill their number one responsibility of protecting the public and preserving the implicit trust given to nuclear plant operators due to the rather unique um, challenges and dangers posed by nuclear technology when it is used as an energy source. My time at the plant also exposed me to the positive correlation that exists between plant performance and plant safety, both industrial and nuclear safety, as well as the necessity of maintaining a questioning attitude in order to reach the Cook plant's identified goal of excellence in nuclear safety. The nuclear safety regime itself is a rather complex web. Um, it involves a variety of interacting and interlocking parts that are both formal and informal in nature. Stakeholders in this regime include um, national regulatory bodies, industry organizations, scientific and expert and technical experts, as well as more general stakeholders, such as the public, the media, and concerned environmental organizations. When one of these components is not functioning properly, it creates the possibility for a large accident to occur, such as the cases of Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and the Fukushima Daiichi accident, or for smaller events that occur more frequently to have more serious consequences than they necessarily needed to have had. I focused my project specifically on the international conventions part of this web, and specifically the 1996 Convention on Nuclear Safety. Prior to this convention, nuclear safety was actually primarily enforced at a national level, which resulted in significant variation existing from country to country in terms of how developed their nuclear safety cultures were. This convention creates two legally um, binding obligations. The first is through its creation of legally binding international nuclear safety standards for the first time. Um, this creation of these standards reflected the international consensus that developed in the early 1990s that achieving higher safety standards for nuclear power plants on a global basis was desirable. The other obligation created is a result of the peer review process that the convention implements. And through this process, it opens up national decisions related to nuclear safety for the first time to consistent international scrutiny. In terms of the research questions that guided my project, I developed three main questions, the first being um, what political factors influenced the Canadian, German, and U.S. negotiating positions during the initial negotiation of the convention, so from 1991 to 1994, what factors influenced when these three countries ultimately ratified the convention, and what influenced their ability to accept a legally binding convention dealing with nuclear safety. I developed two main hypotheses as I was conducting this research, the first being that the unique political situation in the immediate post-Cold War period allowed for the political maneuverability to secure a legally binding convention dealing with nuclear safety. The second is that a combination of safety concerns and then industry governmental relations influenced the perceived utility of the convention for my three case study countries. In terms of methodology, this is a qualitative project that used inductive reasoning and three in-depth case studies. It relied on a combination of primary and secondary sources, as well as an archival visit that was performed to the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library. In terms of my case studies, as you could guess from my research questions, they were Canada, Germany, and the United States. I chose these three nations for a variety of reasons, the most important ones being that um, they were all very heavily involved in negotiating the convention itself, and that during this period, um, all three had large nuclear vendors that were active on the international market, as well as a decent proportion of electric utilities operating nuclear power plants, therefore allowing me to analyze um, countries that had rather defined nuclear industries during this period. I had two main key takeaways from my research, the first being about the safety concerns um, related to the continued operation of Soviet-designed nuclear power plants, primarily in Central and Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. Genuine concerns did exist due to the rather degraded state of nuclear safety in this region of the world. However, it varied significantly from country to country in terms of how severe the deterioration was. So in places such as the Czech Republic and Hungary, they were more 
closely in line with um, Western nuclear safety standards, while nations like Bulgaria and Lithuania, and then certain plants within Ukraine and Russia were severely degraded and were the source of like serious Western concerns. During this period, major um, Western nations such as the US, Canada, um, Germany, France, J and Japan, as well as more um, smaller nations such as Sweden, formed bilateral and multilateral nuclear safety assistance funds to help improve the state of nuclear safety in this region. These concerns were largely sourced to the recognition that another Chernobyl level event could occur in this region due to the rather degraded state of nuclear safety, and that they recognized that um, having another event of that level would impact their ability to use nuclear power as an energy source. My other main takeaway involves the nuclear industry's interest in performing safety improvement work in this region. So although genuine concerns did exist, nuclear vendors did view um, the opportunity to perform this rather lucrative work as a major plus, because during the 1980s and continuing into the 1990s, um, these vendors faced increased difficulty in building plants within the domestic, respective domestic market and therefore looked abroad in order to help maintain their economic viability as they hoped to ride out what they believed to be a rather temporary period of domestic unpopularity. Therefore, they came to view the convention in a rather positive light in that it created the potential for large-scale safety improvement work in Eastern Europe in the former Soviet Union, which they initially believed would be performed by Western vendors such as themselves. After performing the rather lucrative short-term safety work, their ultimate goal was to replace these aging nuclear plants with brand new plants that would be built and sold by Western companies. However, um, that's actually not what occurred due to a variety of political and economic factors, such as um, Western government's ability and willingness to finance these large-scale nuclear safety improvement projects, as well as the increased resistance, primarily from Russia and Ukraine, over what they viewed as simply Western attempts to break into their domestic markets now that they were opening up to international trade. So instead, what more often occurred was that Western vendors would perform short-term work over maybe a couple months to a year and would eventually have a transition to having domestic vendors in these nations perform the majority of the work at these plants. In terms of conclusions from this project, I do believe that during this period, safety improvements were likely necessary to avoid another large-scale accident in this region, just due to the continued operation of these plants, despite the severe degradation that had occurred and that the potential opportunities the industry had hoped to use to ride out their domestic unpopularity ultimately did not materialize. In terms of pivoting from the 1990s to focusing on today, I do believe that it is less likely today to secure any legally binding improvements in the international nuclear safety regime for a variety of reasons. The most significant ones being that um, the nuclear industry has a rather damaged reputation due to the 2011 Fukushima Daiichi accident. There's increased competition in the international nuclear market due to the emergence of new supplier nations, as well as um, the aging of nuclear plants in key countries such as the United States and Canada, who are therefore less willing to impose additional costs on their utility operators than may result from any um, new legally binding obligations. In terms of additional research in this area, I do think it would be worthwhile to pursue. In terms of the period I looked at, so during the 1990s, I think looking at potentially countries in Central and Eastern Europe, the former Soviet Union, and potentially developing nations that utilized um, nuclear energy during this period would be an interesting avenue to explore to view how a convention targeting them was um, their perspective on a convention targeting them in order to analyze what they wanted out of it and what they were willing to accept, as well as perhaps anti-nuclear countries such as Austria during this period, as well as exploring how the nuclear industry responded to nuclear safety negotiations that occurred following the Fukushima Daiichi accident in 2011. I also think exploring um, more thoroughly the interaction between the nuclear safety and nuclear security regimes in the 1990s and through today would be an interesting avenue as well. Thank you for listening to my presentation, and now I'd like to open it up to any um, questions the audience may have.